On April 19, 2002, the body of Alison Chain's lead singer, Lane Staley, was discovered at a Seattle home. An autopsy revealed that Staley had died as a result of an overdose from a speedball, a lethal combination of heroin and cocaine. Alarms were raised when Staley's accountant contacted his former manager, who in turn contacted his mother, Nancy McCallum, who called the police. That day, the Seattle police, along with Nancy, broke into Staley's home to search for her son, where they found him. Unfortunately, when they did, Lane had already passed. Aside from the cause of death, the autopsy also revealed another devastating circumstance surrounding the death of the singer. He had been dead for two weeks prior to being found. So how did a musical icon, a platinum selling frontman of one of the 90s most popular bands, and a voice of a generation to so many, end up dying under such tragic and sad circumstances? Lane Thomas Staley was born on August 22, 1967, in Kirkland, Washington, a small city less than 20 miles from Seattle. According to Nancy, Lane was an extremely quiet and shy child, who cooed when he came out of the womb rather than screamed. As a child, he gravitated towards his parents' record collection, which contained hard rock giants such as Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, and Led Zeppelin. When he was seven years old, his father walked out on the family, an event that deeply wounded the sensitive young child. Speaking in an interview, Staley said of the event, My world became a nightmare. There were just shadows around me. I got a call saying that my dad had died, but my family always knew he was around doing all kinds of drugs. Since that call, I always was wondering, where is my dad? I felt so sad for him and I missed him. He dropped out of my life for 15 years. Undeterred, he continued to search for his father over the years and said, what I found over the years was not good, so I changed my mind about wanting to see my dad again. For a sensitive reserved child like Staley, who spent a huge portion of his life dealing with depression and, later on, his own drug addiction, the impact of being lied to about his father, only to discover that he was alive but had abandoned the family in a constant pursuit of his own addictions, cannot be understated. Like many young kids, Staley had his own musical aspirations. He started playing drums at age 12, playing in many rock bands during his teenage years. And while he started out behind the kit, it would soon become evident that Staley's true calling was behind the mic. He wrote in his school textbooks that his only aspiration was to be a singer, an occupation at odd with the boy's introverted personality. One of Staley's fellow high school alumni was quoted as saying that Staley was the quietest kid in their class, adding, I guess the stage gave him permission to belt out all the feelings he had. A very astute observation when you consider another of Staley's quotes, which reads, Music became my only obsession to stay alive. I had the chance to throw all this anger by music in order to help others. It was therapeutic and worked for me for a while. For Staley, whose innate sensitivity and depressed mindset were only bolstered by his father's abandonment, music became the salvation and, perhaps just as importantly, something he could believe in. In 1984, the young Staley auditioned as a singer for the glam metal band Sleaze. He got the job, and the group soon changed their name to Alice in Chains, with N spelt N apostrophe, a la Guns N' Roses. However, the Alice in Chains that we know today are actually a completely different band from the one Staley initially joined. In fact, the band broke up in the late 80s. After disbanding, Staley joined a funk band, and had asked Jerry Cantrell, a friend who we met at a party, to play guitar for them. Cantrell agreed, but on one condition, and that was that Staley would fulfill vocal duties for his new band. Cantrell had seen Lane perform with Alice in Chains and had been blown away by the singer. He, along with the other members of the group, bassist Mike Starr and drummer Sean Kinney, wanted Staley in their band. To coax him into joining full time, the group auditioned a plethora of awful singers in their shared jam space. The final straw was when they had a male stripper with no discernible vocal ability come in for a tryout. So, out of frustration as much as anything else, Staley became the group's lead singer, leaving his previous band and showing, if nothing else, that he was at least partially aware of his own talent. After toying around with multiple band names, the group liked the sound of Staley's previous band and, with his old bandmate's blessing, added an eye at the beginning of the middle word and thus the incarnation of Alice in Chains we know today was born. 
In July of 1990, the group released its first recording, the three-song EP We Die Young. Much like their very first full-length album, which will be released later that year, We Die Young is a bit of an oral identity crisis, a band still trying to figure out and solidify their sound. Chains, in both iterations, started life as a glam metal band, and this EP sees them with one of their musical feet still planted firmly in that genre. The band's first full-length album, Facelift, released later that year, has the same dichotomy. However, flourishes of what would come to define the band's musical style were still present on these initial releases. The introspective lyrics and doomy riffs on Bleed the Freak, the classic steady cantrell harmonies on It Ain't Like That, the melancholic subdued melody on Confusion, and, of course, Staley's unmistakable soulful wail on Man in the Box. Two years later, in 1992, Alice in Chains would again release one EP, Sap, and one album, Dirt. Both releases marked the maturation of the group musically and compositionally, and solidified the group's new signature sound. Sap was mostly acoustic extended play, five songs showcasing the band at their most melodic, and proof positive of Jerry Cantrell's naked songwriting ability, and the band's aptitude at performing said songs even when unplugged. Dirt, on the other hand, was the group's landmark album and defining statement of intent. An unmitigated commercial success amidst the hype of the grunge boom of the early 1990s and, more importantly, a masterpiece that showed the best of their songwriting and in-studio performances while still managing to distinguish them from their peers sonically. Of course, this video is not about Alice in Chains the group, it's about Lane Staley the musician and the man. However, I still think it's important to give a little bit of history and context for the uninitiated. Now, I just said that Alice in Chains distinguished themselves sonically from their peers. For those who don't know, Alice in Chains were part of the grunge movement that dominated the music scene in the early to mid 90s. At the forefront of that movement were Nirvana, whose 1991 album Nevermind served as a launching pad for the genre from a commercial and cultural standpoint. They, along with three other major acts that emerged from the genre, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains, all fell under the grunge umbrella, and while they shared some musical commonalities, they all actually sounded quite distinct from one another. Now, I'm not going to delve too deeply into these differences here, as I've digressed enough already. However, there were two major components of Alice in Chains' music that set them apart from the other three. The first was their metallic tinge in their music. Even though the group had carved out their own musical niche by this point in their career, the lingering influence of heavy metal could still be heard in their music, more prominently at least than any of the other three groups. So strong was the influence in fact, that it earned them a slot on the Clash of the Titans tour, opening for uncompromising trash metal juggernauts Anthrax, Megadeth and Slayer. However, the second difference is the most pertinent regarding today's subject matter, and that was Staley's voice. Now. The vocalists in all four of these bands had distinct and, quite frankly, great voices, but Staley's was, at least in my opinion, simply on another level. At its core, Lane had an extremely soulful voice, almost bluesy but with a constant vibrato that resonated on almost every elongated vowel he held so masterfully. Just as impressive as Staley's soulful delivery was the sheer diversity of vocal techniques he utilised. He had a vicious, hard rock staccato bark which, when appropriate, would roar atop the groove's heaviest riffs. Conversely, he could lower the decibels down with one of the sweetest coos in rock and roll, not too unlike the noises he made coming out of the womb, demonstrating tremendous vocal discipline. Not only could Lane control the volume of his voice, he also had an impressive vocal range, spanning almost four octaves, with the low subdued rumbles exploding into some of the most striking hard rock shrieks ever recorded. As the rest of the band did as a whole, Staley really came into his own on Dirt. All the aforementioned hallmarks were there. You could pick any combination of songs to exemplify his various vocal gifts, but to really emphasise his versatility, we can find them all on one song. Rooster, one of the album's demi-ballads and, ironically, one of its simplest instrumentally and lyrically, showcases Lane's complex diversity of vocal techniques. In the opening verse, we hear him rifle off some of the quietest lines at his lowest register, while conversely, by the final chorus, he lets out one of his highest and most visceral shrieks. In those same choruses, we hear the bark of the lines, you know we ain't gonna die. 
The soulful vibrato, his most distinct feature, is so prominent here it's not even worth giving an example. Meanwhile, those gentle coups bookend the track at the intro and the outro. All that said, it would be criminal to laud Staley's incredible vocals without also mentioning the singing ability of guitarist Jerry Cantrell. Another key component to the chain sound were those classic Staley Cantrell harmonies, which feature in pretty much every Alice in Chains song from Dirt On. Now, don't get me wrong, Cantrell is a fine vocalist and, being the group's primary songwriter, could easily have fronted the group by himself. However, there is a difference between a good rock singer and a great one, or, in the case of Lane Staley, an elite one. And Staley's vocals elevated Cantrell's compositions to heights they simply could not have reached without him on the mic. To use a sports analogy, Cantrell was like Scotty Pippen from the Chicago Bulls, the perfect role player to Staley's Jordan. As the group's primary songwriter, Cantrell often wrote lyrics concerning a major vice of Staley's, heroin. Given Lane's struggle with the drug, and his ability to swing between beautifully soulful and fiercely aggressive vocal deliveries, he acted as the perfect vessel for Cantrell's cautionary narratives on heroin addiction. And the stain of heroin is all over dirt. In lyrics like, What the hell am I? Leper from inside. Inside wall of peace. Dirty and diseased. And, So your sickness weighs a ton. And God's name is smack for some. And also, What's my drug of choice? Well, what have you got? Staley had been using heroin since his late teens. However, he did at one point in his early 20s make an attempt to get clean. As fate would have it, when Lane was 21, his father came back into his life, conveniently just as his music career was taking off. Understandably tentative about rekindling his relationship with his absentee father, he eventually let his guard down, letting his father back into his life. Sadly, this would prove to be a costly mistake. Speaking of the experience, Staley had this to say. He said he'd been clean of drugs for six years. So why in the hell didn't he come back before? I was very cautious at first. Then the relationship changed. My father started using drugs again. We did drugs together and I found myself in a miserable situation. He started visiting me all day to get high and do drugs with me. He came up to me just to get some shit and that's all. I was trying to kick this habit out of my life and here comes this man asking for money to buy some smack. So not only did this prove to be a costly mistake with destructive consequences, but it also reaffirmed Staley's perception of what his father was, a junkie who couldn't be trusted. One of two songs off of Dirt that Staley claims soul writing credit for is Hate to Feel. He addresses his fractured relationship with his father in the lyrics singing, All this time I swore I'd never be like my old man. What the hey, it's time to face exactly what I am. In my opinion, that pre-chorus is a pretty accurate assessment of Staley's addiction. It would be naive to assume that Staley would never have relapsed had it not been reunited with his father. However, I can only imagine how painful it must have been for the young man to have his father saunter back into his life, claim sobriety, relapse and, in the process, encourage his son to get back on drugs simply to enable his own habit. The emotional scar this left Staley must have been incredibly deep and raw. Now, I'm not one of those people who easily takes a sympathetic stance on bad behaviour just because it correlates with a bad event. However, given his underlying abandonment issues and the history he had with his father, I can't help but understand why Staley would go back to the needle during this time, and how it could have had a domino effect on other events later in his life. Where Staley found himself in 92-93, couldn't have helped his struggle with addiction either. Dirt debuted at number 6 on the Billboard 100, no small achievement for a hard rock act. It also cracked the top 15 in Australia and various European countries, and would eventually go on to be certified platinum in the United States and Canada, and gold in the United Kingdom. Soon after its release, there would be a worldwide tour with Ozzy Osbourne, who himself was seeing a major career resurgence thanks to the commercial success of his 1991 album, No More Tears. At 25 years old, Lane Staley was a rich man, one of the most prominent figures of the now shit-hot grunge movement, and now here he was, on tour with one of the most iconic figures in rock and roll, a man who, at the time, was known for his wild antics and excessive drug use. Needless to say, this was not an ideal environment for a heroin addict, and although Staley was a grown man with full control over his actions, 
it would have taken a very strong man in that situation not to give in to temptation. Staley was not that man. In fact, his habit had gotten so out of control that the band's manager had hired bodyguards to watch over him and prevent anyone who may be using to go near him. Even still, you cannot watch a man 24 hours a day and he found ways around this and continued to get high. I briefly mentioned earlier that Staley struggled with depression. Depression features often in Change's lyrics, a theme that seemed to appear more and more frequently with each subsequent release. And while the group was out on tour with Ozzy Osbourne, Staley was out on stage, front and centre, roaring his feelings of despair and internal conflict in the form of the lyrics found on Dirt. Lyrics like, hate to see, wish I couldn't see at all, hate to feel, wish I couldn't feel at all, and I have never felt such frustration or lack of self-control. I want you to kill me and dig me under. I want to live no more. Post Dirt, the band continued to soar commercially and evolve creatively. The band, now becoming almost as well known for their acoustic EPs as their studio efforts, released their third EP, Jar of Flies, in January of 1994. Unbelievably, Jar of Flies was the first extended play in history, in history, to debut at number one on the Billboard charts. By far the group's best EP and easily one of their best releases period, this seven track gem showcases the group at their most melodic, mature and consistent. Joke track swing on this notwithstanding of course. I always say that Dirt is my favourite Alice in Chains album, but truthfully I swing between Dirt and this. Either way it is, for my money, one of the band's finest hours and embodies them at the peak of their songwriting maturation. In spite of this, not all was well with Alice in Chains. Internal fighting was becoming more common. The group's bassist Mike Starr left and was replaced ironically by Ozzy Osbourne bass player Mike Inez. Tensions between Staley and Cantrell were at an all-time high also, a common schism that has torn apart countless rock and roll partnerships over the decades. This rift can be seen primarily in the lyrics penned by Cantrell on tracks like Don't Follow and No Excuses. With words like I'll just wander my own road, I can't meet you here tomorrow, say goodbye don't follow, coming out of Cantrell's mouth, it will be tempting to assume that he took the rift more personally than Staley. I don't perceive this to be the case though, I simply think Cantrell was just more aware as a person than Staley was, especially externally where he still functioned as the unofficial band leader. I also believe that Lane's penchant for withdrawing from the world probably meant that if amends were being offered to be made, it would be Cantrell making them, not Lane. Also, Cantrell had his own addictions, but they didn't appear, from the outside looking in at least, to swallow him up as they did Lane. And swallow him up they did. As the years rolled on, not only did Staley's addiction remain, his mental state continued to deteriorate, and it showed up more and more in the band's lyrics. Staley wrote the vast majority of the lyrics on Jar of Flies, and while the lyrical landscape of dirt was dispersed across a few different themes, from drug addiction, relationships, anger and depression, almost every song on Jar of Flies is focused on depression and the internal reflection of the self. The opening two songs in particular, Rotten Apple and Nutshell, are not just two of the band's best, they're also two of their heaviest lyrically. They serve as a naked peek into the mind of the writer, with words like, I fight this battle all alone, no one to cry to, no one to call home, and I find repeating in my head, if I can't be my own, I'd be better dead, reading like sad diary entries or the last few lines of a suicide note. The closest Staley came on the album to a Cantrell-esque catharsis occurs on the album's third track, I Stay Away, where he asks an unnamed antagonist, why you act crazy, not an act maybe, going on to say, your weakness builds me, so someday you'll see, before ending the song with its eponymous lyric, bellowing I stay away as the guitars and violins fade out in wounded fear, pain and paranoia. In 1994, Staley was scared into a brief stint of sobriety in the aftermath of Kurt Cobain's suicide. For those totally unfamiliar with 1990s pop culture, Kurt Cobain was the frontman in Nirvana. I mentioned earlier that Cobain's band started the grunge revolution, but that doesn't fully encapsulate Cobain and Nirvana's impact on music and society. While Staley became an icon for those who followed the music, Cobain became a giant in popular culture. One of the most famous people in the world at the time, 
he and his wife Courtney Love became media darlings, and their influence on everything from music to fashion was unprecedented. Cobain was also a junkie and depressive and, unable to cope with his success and his own demons, and the pressure of being a public figure, took his own life on April 5th of that year. Seeing parallels between himself and Cobain both personally and professionally, Staley vowed to kick his heroin habit for good. Alison Chain's management team also turned down multiple touring opportunities over the next two years in a bid to help Lane stay sober. Now, say what you want about band managers, agents and hangers-on. This was a pretty selfless decision on their behalf. The band just had their first ever EP in history debut at number one, were more popular than ever with their fan base, and all the while, anticipation for their imminent third album was extremely high, and surely would be one of the biggest releases seen in the genre up to that point, should it ever come out. A fickle industry at the best of times, the music industry was never more fickle than in 1994. Only three years earlier, grunge had killed glam metal music and relegated metal as a whole into relative obscurity. And after the death of Kurt Cobain, a new wave of bands under the aptly named post-grunge moniker, like Puddle of Mud, Creed and Stained, were poised to take over that niche market. In short, the band were in a position that, at any other time in history, they never would have found themselves in. And that window of opportunity to make music and headline tours and capitalise on their astounding success was closing fast. Truth be told, the band could have easily gone out on tour at that time. Even if Staley was only performing at 50%, or even missed a couple of shows and left Cantrell to take care of frontman duties by himself, the resulting revenue would have made everyone in the band's entourage, not to mention the band themselves, far richer for it. Nirvana's management did it with Cobain in 93 and 94, and although it did nothing to help his mental state, from a business standpoint, it raked in boatloads of cash. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that it's a credit to the people around Staley that he was given additional time to rest and heal, and even pursue other musical projects like the short-lived Mad Season, at a cost to the band's relevancy and the management team's income. Unfortunately, all of this didn't help, as Staley was back using that year. In November of 1995, the band released their third full-length album, the eponymously titled Alice in Chains. It debuted at number one on the Billboard charts also, becoming their second release to top the charts, but their first actual long play to do so. As mentioned previously, with each subsequent release, Staley wrote more and more of the lyrics, and those lyrics focused more on depression, isolation, and internal conflict, reflecting the mind of the author. Song titles like Head Creeps and Shame in You reflect the insular pain Staley was in. In the latter, Staley sings his lowly words of loneliness, I've been hurting, laying, I'm still trying, concentrating, I'm dying. The rest of the album is just as bleak, but still, it is bleakness that is beautifully crafted and performed. The band, however, once again failed to capitalise on the huge success of this album, finding themselves unable to tour due to Stady's continued drug abuse and deteriorating physical and mental condition. Jerry Cantrell had this to say about the whole situation when interviewed in 1996. Very frustrating, but we stuck it out. We rode the good times together, and we stuck together through the hard times. We never stabbed each other in the back, and spilled our guts, and did that kind of bullshit that you see happen a lot. When we talk about addicts, particularly gifted ones whose singing abilities are almost unparalleled, we have a tendency to adopt a more sympathetic slant when writing their story. Ask a fan of Alice in Chains to sum up the singer's troubles and the impact it had on his personal and professional relationships, his or her response will go something like this. Lane Staley was a beautiful soul, an unselfish giver of himself through his music. He was an extremely sensitive and depressed person who grew up without a father, and that's why he became a drug addict. He injected heroin into his veins to escape his pain. During his time on this planet, he gave us some of the most beautiful and powerful music which we have the privilege of still being able to listen to today. His death is one of the most tragic in the history of popular music, but truly, Lane Staley the man, the heart, the soul, was just too beautiful for this world. And on that note, you can practically hear the final chords of Nutshell echoing from that young nihilist speakers as he completes his impassioned monologue. Now don't get me wrong, a lot of what this fictional person said in their hypothetical rant is true. And if you've ever known anyone who's had issues with addiction, 
a part of you has to sympathise with Stady's affliction and personal predispositions. However, what often gets lost in these stories, especially those that have a claim to artists as their subject matter, is another uncomfortable aspect of addiction which, when writing the story of Lane Staley, may be uncomfortable for some to acknowledge. Selfishness. Addiction, particularly heroin addiction, is a selfish affliction. Oftentimes, the user finds himself or herself unable to function within society or contribute to it in any meaningful way. Therefore, they often find themselves in the care of others, be they family, friends, the government, or the hands of charitable people. As the frontman of a successful rock band, not only was Staley well taken care of, but the consequences of his addiction and his inability to function as a result of it had large and long-lasting consequences for the people who relied on him to be professional and do his job. If you think these remarks are callous, take a second to look at it from Jerry Cantrell's perspective. Here's a man, one of the founding members of the band, who, like everyone else in the group, suffered through the initial poverty-stricken years of gigging for no money before finally getting into a deal with a major label in 1990. Unlike everyone else in the band, however, you take it upon yourself to man the helm. You become the band's de facto leader. You write the lion's share of the band's songs, the songs that make up an album like Dirt, and propel you and those playing them to stardom and make everything that precedes that event possible. The EP debuting at number one, tours with Ozzy Osbourne, Grammy nominations, albums being certified platinum two or three times over, offer after offer to go on tour and headline arenas, and in spite of the band's infighting, in spite of the pressures of success, in spite of your own vices and personal problems, you still manage to write and record and do interviews. All of a sudden you're standing at the airport, guitar in hand, waiting to embark on a tour. A tour that could make you more money than you've ever made. Keep your profile up and most certainly lead to more tours. The effects of which will keep your career alive and set you up monetarily for years to come. Here we go, let's do it. First up, Madison Square Garden, but your singer can't get it together. This has been your livelihood for a decade now. You don't have a business degree from a university. Your resume is a sentence long and reads as follows, rock star and junkie. Imagine you've been working in a job for 10 years and through a combination of timing, good fortune, hard work and raw talent, you have the opportunity to ascend to the absolute top of your field. But one person on your team went on a heroin binge and you lost that opportunity. If asked about it, would your response be, and I quote, we stuck it out, we rode the good times together and we stuck through the hard times. We've never stabbed each other in the back. If so, then you're either a saint or a liar. Staley's demons were real. They were very real. I just think it's important to highlight the cost his addiction had on those around him. In April of 1996, the band regrouped for one night to record their version of MTV's Unplugged in New York. A staple of 90s alternative music culture, the most famous and lauded of which was, coincidentally, Nirvana's in 1994. Now, some people draw comparisons between both bands' performances and their respective frontmen. However, for me, there is no comparison. First of all, I'm a big fan of both bands, but I have to admit I like Alice in Chains a lot more, rating them as one of my all-time favourite groups. But that said, Nirvana's Unplugged album is simply undeniable. The performances, the clarity of the guitars, the production, the mix of original songs and obscure but beautifully selected covers, Cobain's imperfect but perfect for the task at hand voice to just the overall vibe of the album. Nirvana's Unplugged was one of those perfect storms, a beautiful snapshot of a music and culture, simultaneously at its rawest and warmest. And even though it was recorded just months before Cobain's suicide, the man arguably never looked or sounded healthier. His voice though, shaky at times, was never a picture of classical ability to begin with and did what it always did throughout Nirvana's career, fit the music perfectly. It soared when it needed to, and was reduced to a near muted murmur when appropriate also. Now, don't get me wrong, Alice in Chains Unplugged is a good album. There were even a few performances which were arguably better than their studio versions. Both songs from Sap are better here, especially Brother, which benefited tremendously from the lack of vocal distortion and increased instrumental clarity. Meanwhile, Frogs from the self-titled album has a haunting quality here that is simply missing from the studio version. 
Angry Chair, while not necessarily superior to the original recording on Dirt, just has a different flavour to it, making them almost two different songs with different qualities. Which, in many ways, was what the Unplugged sessions were designed to do, breathe new life and energy into existing compositions. However, while Nirvana's Unplugged was something of a magical release that immortalised Cobain at his best before his untimely death, Alice's version, sadly, shows Staley for what he was at the time, a man slowly and painfully walking his way towards death's door. Donning shades to hide his eyes and visibly underweight, Staley looked every bit the sick, fractured person he'd become. Even without the aid of the video recording, just listening to it you can hear a weakness in his voice that was, to that point, uncharacteristic of the vocal powerhouse. Nutshell lacks the soul that made the original a tragic classic, Rooster lacks the straight up balls of the original, while Wood is completely devoid of passion. Had Staley been a man mentally willing or physically capable of turning his life around, MTV's Unplugged could have been a great conduit for a career resurgence. However, personal tragedies and continued isolation meant that, aside from a few sporadic recordings and performances here and there, this was Staley's last performance of any genuine regard. In October of 96, Lane's former fiance, Demry Parrott, died of an infection due to a drug overdose. There's a quote in the movie Goodfellas from mobster Henry Hill, right as he's about to get pinched where he simply states, this is the bad time. And for Lane, this really was the worst of times. Without knowing of the death of Staley's one-time fiance, it'd be understandable to assume that the writing was already on the wall. But for Lane, a man broken by his addiction to heroin, whose personal and professional life was falling apart around him, to lose the person with whom he could bond over their mutual vice of heroin, to whom he was, at one point, surely the closest to, a person he had intended on spending the rest of his life with, to have that person taken away from you, especially by the very thing that has essentially ruined your own life, must have been beyond traumatic. And traumatic it was. Staley was placed on a 24-7 suicide watch following her death, and many people believed that this was the straw that finally broke the camel's back, or what part was not already broken. Shortly after his death, Screaming Trees frontman Mark Lanigan summed up the entire horrible situation in as succinct and clear a manner as possible, stating, he never recovered from Demry's death. After that, I don't think he wanted to go on. The final six years of Lane Staley's life is a story of isolation and anonymity. Living in a condo in the heart of Seattle's university district, people would see him sporadically when he went out to buy food or video games. But aside from these excursions, Lane Staley lived the life of a recluse. What we do know for certain is that Staley's health deteriorated dramatically from what was already a questionable state, and that he continued to use. When he emerged to record two tracks with Alice in Chains for their Music Bank box set, the band's producer David Jordan said that Staley weighed 80 pounds and was as white as a ghost. As the years went by and gave way to the dawn of a new millennium, the sun was slowly setting for Lane Staley. Reveling now more than ever in his self-imposed isolation, Staley would not only dismiss pleas from friends, family and management to enter rehab, but would ignore people outright. Alice in Chains drummer Sean Kinney remembers going to his residence three times a week like clockwork and remember how he'd quote, call him, but he'd never answer. Everything I was in the area, I was up in front of his house yelling for him. Even if you could get in his building, he wasn't going to open the door. His mother echoed this when she said that, leading up to his death, friends and family would regularly call and leave voicemails on his answering machine. Staley never returned those phone calls. In fact, in the final 12 months of his life, his mother, who lived in the same state, saw her son only twice, once at Thanksgiving in 2001, and once on Valentine's Day in 2002. That his mother was the closest and most consistent relationship he had in the closing moments of his life, and that he only had these two encounters with her, speaks volumes of the extent of his reclusiveness. As March of 2002 rolled on, in a Seattle condo Staley remained. Emaciated, skin and bones, teeth rotting out of his head, drifting in and out of heroin-induced sleep. Heroin, 
the drug he used to numb his troubled mind and kill the dope sickness which ravages the bodies of all those stupid or desperate enough to stick a needle of poison into their veins. Perhaps the veins in his arms had, at this point, completely collapsed, leaving Staley to inject the hate between his toes or into his dick. Anything to stay well and mentally vacant. Any means necessary. One final attempt was made to save Staley's life. A final life preserver thrown out into the sea of agonising hopelessness in which the 34-year-old was drowning. On April 4, 2002, the day before his death, Chain's bassist Mike Starr visited his former bandmate on his own birthday to check up on him. According to Starr, he pleaded with Lane to let him call 911. So concerned was he at the condition that his friend was in. In response, Lane threatened to end their friendship if he called the cops on him, even if it was for his own good. Starr, understandably, walked out of Lane's condo, leaving the singer alone. Later that evening, Lane called Starr on the phone pleading with him not to leave him. Not like this. Starr, hurt by his friend's earlier threats and hostility, ended the phone call and went home. The next day, his friend was dead. A guilt-ridden Starr, years later in an interview, said he deeply regretted not calling the police anyway, stating that he'd rather have lost Lane's friendship if it meant keeping him alive. He blamed himself for his friend's passing, right up until his own death in 2011 from a drug overdose. Most of the videos dealing with the subject matter of Lane Staley end with a rose-tinted recap of the man and his musical career. But the fact is, I don't need to reiterate the fact that Lane was a tremendously gifted singer with a one-of-a-kind voice, an earth-shattering performer, talented songwriter and a cultural icon for a musical counterculture which, for one brief moment, was the driving force of the most popular form of music in the world. My admiration for Staley and his contribution to music has been on naked display for almost the entirety of this video. When I first started listening to Alice in Chains, I was blown away by the music. Like many young, angsty teenage assholes, I looked up to them as a role model, guitar-wielding proprietors of the finest hard rock, giving voice to the problems I thought I had. I still love their music. However, what blows me away even more today is how someone so beloved personally, admired globally and coveted professionally, could find themselves rotting away, both physically and mentally, in complete isolation for half a decade. Until the cocktail of drugs he was punishing himself with finally did what they were bound to do. Kill him. I could not understand how someone of Staley's renown could lay dead on the floor of their condo for two weeks weighing 86 pounds at 6 feet tall, partially decomposed, before finally being found and laid to rest. Staley's story is a cautionary one, sure, but I also think his story is a painfully human one. Wishful ignorance dictates that his death was the result of a hypersensitive, depressed soul who simply could not deal with the cold realities of the world. Conversely, the hypercynic would tell you that Staley died due to the fact that he was a heroin addict a junkie who threw his life away at the dizzying heights of success because he just couldn't get his shit together and take the needle out of his arm. In my opinion, the source of Staley's fate was no greater than the sum of its parts, but an absolute and perfect sum total of them. You take a sensitive child, with a father who'd rather get high than be part of his life, only to come back into his life and not only keep using, but get his only son hooked back on the drugs he was trying desperately to kick. He gravitates towards music, his only other avenue for venting his pain and frustration, and submerges himself in a culture that is not only conducive to creativity, but drug abuse. A platinum album later, and now the fragile mind has to deal with constant temptation and the pressures of fame on top of a predisposition to depression and feelings of abandonment. Already you can see a person driven to the point of isolation to escape his pain. Another platinum album, more money, more pressure, no alleviation from his troubled mind, equates to more heroin. A fragile mind is followed by a fragile body, unable to tour, barely able to stand up. He seeks refuge in his room, away from prying eyes. A fiancé dies from a cause that he knows he could have helped her with, something they could have kicked together, something that he knows ultimately will lead to his own demise. This feeling of unrelenting guilt, coupled with a renewed sense of abandonment, puts the needle right back in his arm. 
Of course, Lane Staley was very much in the throes of adulthood when all this took place. He had complete agency over his actions. He chose to do this to himself. All of this is true, yes. However, as you go through life and you see the pain that people have to deal with on a daily basis, you naturally become more sympathetic to their vices because, as a human, you've probably been handed a bum hand at some point in your life and turned to drugs, alcohol, sex, food or something else that's negative as a distraction from reality. It's a stupid thing to do, a destructive thing to do, and it's ultimately, at the end of the day, your own fault. But it's also human, painfully human. Ultimately, as Lane grew older, I think his ability to cope with his issues diminished. I think he saw his problems, compounded on top of each other, as insurmountable and, in a way, resigned himself to his faith. Staley's story proves that no matter how beloved we are, how successful we become, how much money we make, and how highly we may find ourselves being held in regard for our talents, a depressed or drug addled mind will dim the star that shines within us all, and make us see only the darkness. For the rest of us, the silver line should be that as bad as things may seem at any given time, the fact that the darkness took a brilliant man like Staley should not be seen as proof positive of its power, but validating that it is in fact an illusion, a shadow that hangs over us but is ultimately incapable of harm, unless we allow it to take us over, and we harm ourselves on its behalf. In the immortal words of Lane Staley, loneliness it shadows me, quicker than darkness, crawls to the surface of my skin, visibly surrounded by it. At one time, Staley was able to overcome the shadows of his own demons to record this wonderful music, and, in the process, gave strength to thousands of people to do the same. And even though Lane Staley was ultimately unable to escape the darkness, take inspiration from his lyrics and escape the darkness that surrounds you. In tribute. <laughs>